We're starting a new series today called Be Christmas to the World. And it's very much focusing on Jesus' heart for the world in the season that we are walking into right now. The title of my sermon is Cultivating a Christ-Centered Community. And so in a moment, we're going to be exploring John 13, verses 34 and 35. But as we embark on this time today, I want to remain mindful of a couple of things. We're about to enter a season where we build and we rebuild community with our family, with our friends, with work colleagues, in probably the most unique season and year that we've ever found ourselves in. And therefore, the value of community over the next three or four weeks to the year end is more significant, more potent, more powerful now than probably at any other time in our natural lives here on this earth. But I want to start with a couple of questions for your consideration this afternoon. And these these questions will act as a, a compass as we navigate the journey in front of us. Is the central or primary community that you find yourself in this afternoon Christ-centered? And what I mean by that is, is it capturing the heart of Jesus? Is it conveying to the people that are outside of that community the love of Jesus? Would I, if I didn't know you, to spend just a few minutes on the outside looking in on this community that you primarily sow into and invest and give your time and your efforts, would I be able to identify it as a gathering of Christian believers, loving one another, serving one another, lifting each other up in the body of Christ today? The second part of my question, if you like, is what sort of value are you adding to this group? Are you just a mere spectator? Are you just someone that's essentially just taking part, doing the minimum, or are, you, or are you active? Are you engaged? Are you involved? Are you driving the agenda of Christ forward in this group? Are you standing up for the gospel in this group? Are you the, the leading light, if you like, of that group? Because how we reflect and answer those two questions will determine the strength of the community that we find ourselves in this afternoon. Because here is the thought that we must remain mindful of. Everywhere in Scripture that Jesus went, he built, rebuilt, created, redefined, and shaped community. Everywhere that he went. It's at the forefront of his heart. It's everything that he stood for. You think about him right at the start of his ministry, Sermon on the Mount. What did he do? He took his disciples away from the others. He took them up a hill, I guess a hill, a mountain. And he leaned in almost whispering to say, hey, there's some stuff I want to share with you that might not be relevant to the crowds, which forces a question for us today. Are we a fan of Jesus? Are we a follower of Jesus? Or are we a disciple of Jesus? Because if you're a fan, it's a fleeting interest. It's something that piques your attention for a certain period of time, You can relate to certain aspects of that person or that company or that community. Hey, praise God. But then it it kind of dies and and gives way because you've not invested into it. If you're a follower, then there's a little bit more intention, a little bit more scope, a little bit more value that you're adding. But there's going to come a time where the the rubber hits the road (laughs) and you might check out because it's not quite convenient for you or it's costing you a little bit too much. In the portion of scripture that we're about to assess and examine, Jesus is clearly speaking to his disciples. The context is, is pretty clear. It's the just finished the Last Supper, which already should inform us that the words that Jesus is about to say are highly charged. They are potent, they are powerful, they carry what I would consider to be an augmented state of for our attention. These are not feeble words thrown in to pad out John 13 to meet a quota of words. No, no, these are at the forefront, the epicenter of all that Jesus is trying to convey to who? His disciples. 
To be a disciple of Jesus Christ, it's going to cost you much more than being a fan or a follower. And so I pray that as we go through this journey this afternoon, that we remain mindful of those things. Because as we survey the landscape of the body of Jesus Christ today, what do we find? I've done a bit of examination, a bit of exploration on this myself. I find two distinct groups. Let's be clear that this pandemic has not been easy on anyone. But what has emerged is very, very significant. There are two groups. First, there is a group of believers in the body of Christ, irrespective of race, gender, age, intellect, anything, where whose relationships have strengthened, enhanced, grown, matured, developed through this pandemic. That's the first group. The second group, it's the reverse. It's the complete opposite. They're struggling to gather. They're not able to connect. They're not able to build meaningful community. They're struggling to adapt to the conditions of, unfortunately, living on Zoom. And some of us are a little bit Zoomed out because we are built for community. We're built to be in fellowship. But I'm perturbed, if I guess I'm honest, about those two groups because the contrast is so stark that there has to be fundamental differences between these two groups. If the margin was a lot smaller, you could put it down to culture, context, age groups, you know, younger people are a little more tech, technically savvy, perhaps. But the gap is so big that it demands an answer. And I believe the answer is found here in John 13, 34 and 35. I believe the first group of people have found a way to love one another the way that Jesus has called us to do. And I think the second group have a pale imitation of what that love looks like because the relationships are not formed and forged through adversity. They're built on convenience. They're built on communities that aren't necessarily focused on the things of God. But when we're focused on the things of God, no pandemic can stop the body of Christ meeting. No pandemic can stop the believers gathering to encourage one another, love one another the way that Jesus has called us to. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to John 13. It's verses 34 and 35. ESV I'm reading from. A new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Now, is this really a new commandment? If you want the short theological answer, the answer is no. It's not a new commandment, but it's a new depth that Jesus is trying to show the disciples on how they now need to love. Because at this point, the disciples haven't been able to love to the degree, the depth, the detail and the richness that God is calling them to. But consider it. We are called to love one another as I have loved you. That is evidence. That is the testimony that we need to carry to our communities in the weeks that lie in front of us as we embark on Christmas and all that it entails. Now, also we need to remember Matthew 24, verse 12. Jesus himself speaking because iniquity shall abound, the love of many will grow cold. We live in a day and an age, pre, during, or post COVID-19, of abounding iniquity and diminishing love. And here is the antidote. What people need now more than ever is to feel and appreciate the love of God like never before. Hello. And you are carrying it. You are a vessel of God's love. What are you communicating to the people that God has connected you to in the season that you find yourself in? You have a gift. You have a talent. You have an ability. Now, granted, many people have not grown up with the right kind of love, and therefore they need to find the true love, the perfect love, the rich, the unconditional love from the Heavenly Father. Now, the third word in these verses I find highly persuasive. This command, so this is not Jesus 
saying, hey, if you're really interested in growing a little bit beyond your Sunday school teaching, take a moment to understand this. This is not a suggestion. He's not giving you food for thought. He's not giving you an idea for you to ruminate and reflect on for the next 30 years of your Christian journey. A commandment. It's an instruction. It's something we have to subscribe and adhere to irrespective of the cost. That's the challenge for us. The quantifiable risk that we have to absorb in loving someone, not knowing if they are going to love you back. Does that diminish our appetite to love them anyway? It shouldn't, but we find that it does. And here is the sobering reality. I'm going to be a little bit blunt and a little bit bullish with you this afternoon here. That if we are not loving the way that Jesus has commanded us to, here's a thought. Are we truly honoring and loving the Lord? Because we cannot say with our heart one thing, but live out something so significantly different. We have to decide what side of the fence we are on. We have to be prepared to pay the cost to love people for who they are and where they are. Now we have those choices and that free will that God gives us, but we also have to appreciate the consequences attached to the decisions that we make. And I have found time and again, the people that say, oh, I don't feel loved, I don't feel appreciated, are the ones that demonstrate it the least. Hmm. There's a thought. A thought for us this afternoon to dig a little deeper, to go a little further, to be prepared to count the cost. We have to build our relationships with one another. It has to be a reflection of our relationship with Christ. If we find ourselves cold, a little bit removed from reality, a little bit flimsy in our relationships, it's probably a reflection of how we are living our relationship with Christ. It's probably a little bit distant, a little bit mediocre. It's not leaning in. It's not seeking the heart of God at all costs in our lives. We have to decide in our heart, friends, that we are going to affirm and endorse the commandments that Jesus gives us here. It's not just something that we're going to affirm and endorse, that we have to decide in our hearts that we are truly going to not, not just accept it, but we're going to live it out in every aspect of our lives. The newness of this command comes from the standard that Jesus himself presents. He says to love one another as I have loved you. You must love one another. Awkward. <laughs> Awkward, right? There's no get outs. <laughs> There's no mitigating circumstances. We can't say on Tuesdays, we don't do that. Must. There's something very intentional about that. There's something very purposeful, something very forward focused about that. Why? Because Jesus wants us to carry what we have, what we have received in our hearts from him to everyone that we encounter in the world. Surely we would want to put the best of God's love on display with everyone that we encounter. Amen. Can I get a witness? Amen. We wouldn't want to give a distorted view or a diluted view of God's love that we have freely embraced and received and, re and enjoy each and every day. We wouldn't give a watered down version of that to other people. We would want them to see the fullness of it, the richness of it. But here's another thought. Perhaps our default position is that we don't love one another. If we're being instructed to this degree by Jesus, perhaps our default position is that we don't love one another the way that we need to. Now, just to be clear, this is not a I'm going to love you until I can't stand you type of love either. This is a love that is going to cost you. It's going to be continuous. It's going to be confident, but it's going to cost you. And so the question for us this afternoon is, are we prepared to pay the cost? Because my first point here is, love isn't new, but loving the way that Jesus does is new. A bit of revelation for us. We can see it right earlier on. Jesus washes his disciples' feet. His love for his own didn't stop when things became difficult, when things were perhaps a little bit unpopular, when things were going to be a little challenging for him. He was prepared to see it through to completion in his life. He gives us this example and he expects us to affirm it. 
Jesus loved unto death. Because of this love, he was willing to die to give us what we need. And I want to challenge us this afternoon to love our neighbor to that same degree. Are we prepared to do it? Jesus ultimately took the law further and his love went deeper. Ultimately, the love that Jesus has for you is unquantifiable. It's so rich, it's so compelling, it's relentless and unconditional towards us. Now, love isn't new, but loving one another in a costly, sacrificial way, the way Jesus does, is new. Point two, we must learn to love one another unto death. <laughs> Breaking news. I think we need to emphasize that in our relationships with one another. I think that's something that we need to start to pay a little bit more attention to in our lives. We fall into these religious relationships of convenience where if you've got something that can help me get ahead, I'll connect with you. It's not the love that Jesus is talking about here. He's not talking about a superficial, shallow kind of love. He's talking about a love that goes further, a love that will take you deeper and beyond anything that you have previously enjoyed. Jesus expects us as believers to love the church to the same strength with the same depth that Jesus loves you. Now the word just is different, is, is interesting for us because it highlights that Jesus has already demonstrated to the disciples, this is the standard, friends. So it's a non-negotiable standard. It's not like, here, this is where I'm going to set the bar, and now let's have a chat about it. No, no, no. Jesus is making it very, very clear. This is the standard I have shown you. There is capacity. There is scope. There is capability for you in your life to reach that standard. Here's a thought. Are you prepared to love unto death? You think about wedding vows. I've officiated a few weddings. Some of the words that are used, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, we all know the words, until death us do part. Is there a gap between what we say and what we live out? Because if there is, it's going to create tension that we are going to have to reconcile, not just in our relationship with God, but in our relationship with each other. There are no mitigating circumstances to justify anyone here withholding any of the love that Jesus is demonstrating us. It's going to cost you to love the way Jesus loved. It ultimately cost him everything, and yet he was prepared to pay that price. You are to love your brothers and sisters in the body of Christ just the way Jesus loves them. So what does that actually look like? Well, let me be clear. As Christians, we should serve one another, prefer one another, love one another, be committed to one another, seek to do good for one another, honor one another, encourage one another, bear one another's burdens, correct one another in love, and provide for one another. Now, if you're wondering about all these one another's, there are 68 or 69 of them in the New Testament for you to explore. All of them affirm the fact that we are best served and loving Jesus when we love other people the way that Jesus calls us to love. But here's a third consideration for us. Ultimately, as Christians, we are identified by our sacrificial love for others. Have you considered that? In your own personal walk, what would that actually look like this afternoon? By this, in verse 35, he says, by what? Exactly. By, by the self-sacrificing love unto death. That's what he's referring to. All people. So at this point, indiscriminate. Christian, non-Christian. Everyone. We can't go setting up parameters. Okay, I'm going to love my Christian brothers and sisters to this degree. But these people over here don't know Jesus. So I'm going to love them a little bit less. This guy's political persuasions don't align with mine. So he's getting a little bit less love. No, 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 no. Equal measure, equal measure. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples. The proof that we are disciples of Jesus is that we love one another in the love of Jesus Christ. All people, Christian, 
non-Christian. No greater accolade, friends, than to be affiliated with the love that we have that's connected to the Father's heart. No greater accolade than someone looks at you, looks at your community, and goes, wow, there is something incredibly pure. There's something incredibly authentic about this community. Because the world we live in, it's relationships of convenience. Do you follow me on Instagram? No, so I'm not following you. Okay, knock yourself out. It's ridiculous. If that's the, if that's the, if that's the level of your relationship, I, I feel very sad for you, to be perfectly honest. Because it's easy come, easy go. It's not cost you anything to build that relationship. And therefore, when, when offense occurs, when the trials emerge, you just check out. It's easy to do. But we have to go far beyond the standard of the world. Now more than ever, the world is craving authenticity. Are you aware of that? Now more than ever. You think about the pandemic. You think about how people have struggled to stay connected just to family. Forget building maintaining friendships, just stay connected to family. And we can either measure it by quantity or we measure it by quality. Jesus had 12. Like, those were the main people that he gave probably 70% of his ministry time to. Just 12 people. There's probably four or five times that in this room. So who were you investing into? Who were you giving your all to? Are you going for quantity or are you going for quality? Because Jesus was very, very clear. Love as I have loved you. It's a risk to love. There's a cost attached to it. There's a consistency that's mandatory for it. And for anyone that's married in this room for any period of time, I would say north of five years, you will know there's going to be times in your marriage where you just have to love, even if you don't, quote, feel like it. Because love is not a feeling, right? Love is a decision. For God so loved the world that he what gave. It's an action. It's a decision. It's not a feeling. It's not a fleeting emotion that we have in a given moment that then bypasses when something else of greater interest peaks our focus. It's a love that goes further, a love that goes deeper, a love that goes stronger than anything that this world has to offer you in any capacity. You know, our soul prospers when we are full of the love of God, the word and the grace of God in every aspect and area of our lives. And that will bleed over. People will see something different about you. Trust me, if you've ever been to any market anywhere in London, you can buy all this fake designer bags. You know, when you know what a real one looks like, huh? you can spot the fake a mile off. The fake one costs you a fraction of the real one. And then when it breaks, when, right, you just go out and get another one. The real one, it's going to cost you hundreds of pounds for that bag, jacket, wallet, purse, whatever it is. You're going to look after it. You're going to steward that well. You're going to keep that you know, in the box or whatever it is after you finished using it. Why? It's cost you. Swap that out for your relationships. Authenticity. Trust me. Authenticity and dependability are the two biggest qualities to forging Christ-centered community. Go beyond the politics. Go beyond the theological persuasions that you have or don't have in scripture. Go beyond your culture. Go beyond your context. Go beyond the age group that you find yourself in. Decide in your heart that Christ is going to be the epicenter. Christ is going to be the rock upon which your community grows and flourishes. The best possible outcome when we think about our friends and our family that don't know Jesus is what? That they come to know Jesus. Amen? That is the best possible outcome. I trust me, if you have any friend or family member this year, it doesn't matter what present you buy them. I guarantee you the best gift you can give them is the love of God. The best gift. But how on earth are you going to demonstrate and provide that gift if you're not able to love the person next to you? If you're not able to love the way that Jesus loved, you're giving them a distorted or diluted version of that love and hoping and praying against the odds that they will still be able to buy into it. 
You know, we need to tear down the limitations. We need to remove the strongholds of our mind. We need to heal from the hurts, the people, the situations that we found ourselves in that have hurt us from our past in order for us to move forward. Love goes beyond merely making some feeble commitment at one point or another or sharing encouraging words periodically with one another. Love is being completely committed unto death no matter the cost. Love is keeping your promises no matter what. Authentic love will always seek the best possible outcome for the other person, regardless of the cost to self. So if we don't love one another, is there any reason that we can demonstrate this afternoon that we even belong to Jesus? If it's not manifesting, if it's not on display, if there's no evidence that you can present that would highlight that you have the love of Christ in your heart, imagine I'm not a believer and I meet you. There's no evidence. <laughs> what, what are you expecting me to believe? The only way it works is if it's demonstrated. Love is action. It's always demonstrated in action. It's always expressed. We can back it up with words, but the words themselves carry minimal value. We will always see it in action. And that's where we are most powerful, I believe, in our Christian journey. Number four, why? Why do we not love one another the way that Jesus loves us? I am fully convinced of this point. The number one reason and so, therefore, I am suggesting there are others, but I believe this is, this is the overarching, this is the lion's share of the reason for this, is that we ourselves are not experiencing the love of Jesus in our own lives. Because once you're experiencing the love of Jesus day by day in your own life, it's going to manifest, it's going to pour out, it's going to seep out of everything that you do, everything that you say. You can't contain it. Hmm? And therefore, if we're not able or we're not willing to love the way that Jesus loves, I would suggest you might be a little bit barren in your own love appreciation of what Jesus has done in your own life. And so the best antidote is get closer to him. Draw closer to the Father this afternoon. Open your heart. Let him pour into you through the leading of the Holy Spirit all the love and the courage that you're going to need to start loving other people that way. Amen? I appreciate that that's a statement that might cut. It's a statement that might even challenge you. But I hope, if anything, it provokes you to examine and explore the personal relationship that you enjoy with Jesus Christ each and every day. Because what goes in us has to come out of us in every area of our lives. There's nothing that's hidden that isn't revealed by God. And so if we're carrying the heart and the love of God here, it's going to manifest. So follow my train of thought here. If we disobey, willingly or otherwise, Jesus' commandments, we can begin to get doubt our personal love for God. And if we begin to doubt our love for Jesus, then what manifests as a result of that? We start to doubt that Jesus loves us. Do you see the vicious cycle that, begin, that can begin to emerge? But if we experience God's love poured out in our lives, if we look at the cross day by day, we will start to see and appreciate the love of the Father afresh from a new vantage point. A fresh landscape will start to be built in our lives where we are not hindered or hampered by the challenges that happened in our past, but we are set free. We are released to love radically and passionately just the way that Jesus did. And you know, we love someone, you love them not for what they can do, but simply for who they are. Which means we need to see every person, the believers and the people who are not yet Christians. I don't call them non-Christians, pre-Christians. Amen. Faith statement. Pre-Christians. We get to put that love on display. And that's the call for us this afternoon. Are we prepared to do that? Are we prepared to be healed from our own hurts? The challenges, the issues. 
to move forward because God's love is perfect. Perfect. There's no blemish. There's no spot. There's no issue attached to it. It's absolutely perfect. Which means we need, we need to regularly reflect on a couple of aisles, relationship, responsibility, and reflection. We need to understand that it's our responsibility to put the love of Christ on display each and every day. Our relationship with Jesus is going to manifest in our relationship with each other and constantly reflecting on our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Because as we experience God's love, it will grow and deepen. And therefore, our willingness to love and serve other people will always increase. Always. Because we learn to love without borders, without boundaries, without limits. Now that's not easy <laughs> because it cuts across the culture of our day. It goes against the grain to lay down our lives, to serve and love sacrificially. Do we truly sacrifice? We find that people are different, so we need to find new ways to love people. Our common denominator is time. Simply put, if we don't want to give our time to others, then we will never be able to show them the love of Christ. Time. It's your most valuable asset. We would all give up money before we'd give up time. And years and years and years ago, you would spend a lot of time to save a little bit of money. Now we spend a lot of money to save a little bit of time. Hmm? It's a thought for us. R.T. Kendall always says, children spell love T-I-M-E. It's true. We're children. We're sons and daughters of the Most High God. We should spell love, T-I-M-E. And we should demonstrate that to everyone that we encounter. So what did Jesus do? Every area of Jesus' ministry, he invested his time. You think about the woman at the well, a perfect example. Culturally, Jesus wasn't even obliged to acknowledge her, much less talk to her. What did he do? He invested his time. The greatest thing that ever happened to that woman at the well. And what did she do as a result of Jesus investing his time? She went and told everyone about the town, about what Jesus had done. How did he use his time? Ultimately, he used it with others and his Father in heaven. Learn this. As we love like Jesus, we will lead people to Jesus. That's the sounding board for us this afternoon. Now we're talking about a selfless love. Now we live in a society that puts a lot of emphasis on self-effort, self-improvement, self-progress. It's not about anything or anyone but ourselves. Jesus went against the culture of the day then, and that's even more prevalent, even more blatant in today's society. And so ask yourselves the question, are you truly prepared to throw yourself at everything to love others, to build a Christ-centered community? Or is it, I'll do it in my spare time, I'll do it when I've got a minute, I can certainly do it on Sundays if you want me to, Brother Scott. No, this is 24-7, 365, this is your life, this is your ministry. This is everything that Jesus asked you to do. Captured in two verses. Because you know, once somebody has experienced the love of Christ, whether they are a pre-Christian or, or, or already a believer, one thing that they cannot do is deny what they've experienced. Hmm? Have you thought about that? That will shift our perspective. That should provoke greater levels of emphasis and focus for us this afternoon. And it is not easy, but it is possible. And so we have to ask ourselves, are we prepared to do it? Jesus said no to self. He laid down his life that he might serve others. Can we do the same this afternoon? Because, you know, ultimately... We live out what we truly believe. We've got to take the time to build those relationships. We've got to invest the effort, the sacrifice, without expecting a reward day one, minute one. I guarantee you, whoever led you to the Lord, you didn't get led to the Lord day one, minute one, that that person shared the gospel with you. How many times have they taken you out for dinner, met you for coffee, phoned you to pray with you, turned up at you know, your dog's funeral, whatever? 
They demonstrated the love of God to you a thousand different ways, 999 of them that you probably never even acknowledged or even recognized before the penny dropped. So please, don't, don't go so far and go, well, you know, I'm only going to do this if I see a manifestation, day one, minute one. You know, 14 and a half years, I demonstrated the love of God to my own parents. 14 and a half years, every week, before they came to Jesus. Hello? That's a testimony. That should build confidence that God knows what he's doing, and in the fullness of his time, he makes everything beautiful. And I had to chip away, I had to pray, I had to encourage, I had to everything for 14 and a half years. Not once did I give up. Now, you might say, oh, they're your parents. Sure, no question. But I've taken that same approach with everyone that I encounter because in God's eyes, everyone is equal. And here's the thing. You're so unique, you're so special to God that you're the only person in the world with your fingerprints. You're the only person in the world with your fingerprints. Jesus knows the number of hairs on your head. So who am I not to demonstrate that level of love to you? Hmm? It's not what the Bible shows me. It's not what the Word of God shows me. But you know, we build in preferences and presuppositions. We align and affiliate ourselves with those that agree with us relationally, theologically, politically, socially, economically, whatever. And yet if you take the 12 disciples, they're essentially a motley crew. You know what that means, right? These, these people would never have met each other if it wasn't for Jesus. They came from so many different walks and areas of life. They would never have known each other. But they were all gathered and connected by one thing, the love of Jesus. And the evidence is 11 of the 12 of them were martyred for that love. And only John died a natural death. But they tried to kill him. It was just the oil. He, would, he wouldn't die. Bless him. That's the level of conviction that we need to have. So we need to rise up, friends, in this Christmas time that we find ourselves in. Do not get a distorted view that you can't do it. You can do it. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. You are a somebody in the body of Christ. God has placed people in your life to demonstrate the love of God to this afternoon. God is going to use your gifts, your virtues, your qualities, your attributes. And God is also, dare I say it, he's going to use your life experiences. And I have found as I've grown in terms of age and maturity, in my own Christian journey, more often than not, God uses the moments of distress, the moments of sadness, those moments of disappointments where you learn to speak not from your wounds, but from your scars. You learn to speak because of what God has done in and through every aspect and area of your life. God has planted and positioned you exactly where you are right now today for a great move. For a great move this Christmas time, where the people in our primary community and locality, wherever that is, are going to know the love of Jesus Christ in deeper, richer, more profound and tangible ways because of what you are carrying. What you are carrying. Are you prepared to be a vessel for his glory this afternoon? God doesn't make mistakes. There's no plan B with God. It's always plan A, which informs us this afternoon that we must prepare ourselves correctly to be used by him. You know, the measurement of God's love is the cross. Our love for God is always best expressed in our love for others. You are never more like God than when you are helping hurting people, lifting up the fallen, loving your neighbor, serving the needy, restoring the brokenhearted. Establish one another in love this afternoon. Serve one another in love. Because you know, you're either driven and motivated by your past or by the glorious hope and future that we possess in Christ, but you can never be driven and motivated by both. You have to decide today which side of the fence you will be on. So let our thoughts, let our words, let our actions be a reflection this afternoon of the sacrificial servant love of God. Intentionally choose to direct your time, to channel your efforts, sharpen your discernment, and empower yourself to love passionately, live radically, and serve sacrificially. 
It's not necessarily a secret, but a lot of times I get asked, well, how do you enjoy the levels of relationships with so many different people in the body of Christ, Scott? And I'll be honest, I have an answer for you. When all is said and done, when you strip away everything else, people want to be led and loved, not managed and tolerated. They get that at work. The last place they want that is in the body of Christ, in their cell groups, in their downline gatherings, or in their communities. Amen? We must love people for where they are now, for the sake of who they also may become in the years to come. We love them regardless of what they can or can't do for us, which means that we must divorce ourselves from the deceptive relationships of convenience and fully embrace this command, love one another as I have loved you. And it is in that moment, and that moment alone, friends, that we begin cultivating a Christ-centered community. And it's in that moment, therefore, that God will get all the glory and all the honor. In Jesus' name, amen.